Today's video is sponsored by Squarespace. You've probably heard of Squarespace before, but in case you haven't, it's an all-in-one platform for building your brand and growing your business online. With Squarespace, you can create a beautiful website, engage with your audience, and sell anything you want. From products to services, Squarespace has got you covered. It's easy to use, and it has amazing features like member areas, analytics tools, blogging tools, email campaigns, and much more. For example, member areas, they allow you to create and monetize by creating a special area in your website behind a paywall that allows you to sell access to exclusive content and make a little bit of money. Squarespace also has email campaigns, as I mentioned, which allows you to email your audience with ease and save a bunch of money because outside of Squarespace, those can be really expensive. Squarespace's analytics tools also provide you with powerful insights into who's visiting your site, where they're coming from, and how they're interacting with your content. With this information, you can make informed decisions to grow your business and increase engagement. So there you have it. Squarespace is a game changer if you're looking for a platform to create a beautiful website, grow your audience, and sell anything you want. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash brain food to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. And now today's video. Way back in 1951, in a tiny recording studio in Memphis, Tennessee, a fascinating bit of music history was created. Partly by accident, partly by design, the recording of the track Rocket 88 by Ike Turner and his Kings of Rhythm helped create a movement and a sound which forever altered the sonic landscape. The 1950s understandably garner much attention for music historians. It's the decade almost universally agreed to have witnessed the birth of modern popular music, specifically in the form of rock and roll. But what exactly is rock and roll, and where did it come from? Most defining sources will tell you that the genre combines elements of rhythm and blues and country music. So far, so good, although you do have to keep in mind that rhythm and blues in the 1950s meant something quite different from today's understanding of the term R&B. Back then it was used to describe musicians such as Lewis Jordan and Winoni Harris who infused traditional blues chord structures with an up-tempo jumping energy. Add in the swing of contemporaneous country music and you have something approaching classic rock. There is, however, another defining and crucial facet it, the presence of the electric guitar as lead instrument. So what makes Rocket 88 so important? Well, let's start with the band, Ike Turner and his Kings of Rhythm. Turner may be better known for his later 1960s and 1970s work with his then-wife Tina Turner, but his musical roots go way back. Born in 1931, Turner can genuinely claim to hail from a historic site himself, Clarksdale, Mississippi, a town with significant links to early blues. In fact, many cite Clarksdale as the birthplace of the blues. On that note, many famous musicians called Clarksdale home, including Sun House, Sam Cooke, John Lee Hooker, and a host of others. Needless to say, Ike, who began playing piano and guitar while still a child and formed the Kings of Rhythm in his teenage years, grew up surrounded by music, which was to provide the bedrock of rock and roll. As the band, the Kings of Rhythm were actually an offshoot from a big band ensemble called the Top Hatters. With over 30 members, it was perhaps inevitable that the Top Hatters found themselves pulled in opposite directions. Whilst many wanted to play jazz, the other section, led by Turner, favoured R&B. The band split along those lines, and under Turner's guidance, the remaining Kings of Rhythm developed a hard-edged, high-energy sound. Turner took piano duties, 17-year-old Raymond Hill provided scorching tenor sax, Jackie Brenston baritone sax and vocals, Willie Kaisart guitar, and Willie Sims drums. Clearly, they were a talented bunch, as evidenced by the fact that no lesser person than the great B.B. King, who happened to hear them playing in their home state, suggested that they ought to cut a record. The studio and producer King directed the band to was an hour and a half's drive north, in Memphis, Tennessee. And enter the picture Samuel Cornelius Phillips, a person who, perhaps more than any other, can take credit for significantly aiding the genesis of rock music. Born to a family of farmers near Florence, Alabama, Phillips was the youngest of eight siblings. In his youth, he worked alongside black laborers picking cotton. Phillips would later state that the sound of these laborers singing had a lasting influence on his life and work. Initially planning a career in law, the Great Depression had put pay to that idea. The family went bankrupt, Phillips's father died, and the would-be defense attorney took on various menial jobs to provide for his mother and siblings. Eventually, Sam managed to land himself a role as an announcer at WLAY radio station in Muscle Shoals, Alabama. Here, he met his future wife, Rebecca Burns, and gradually transitioned to a dual job as DJ and radio engineer. WLAY was one of few stations at the time to pursue a so-called open format of programming, playing music by both white and black musicians, a fact which was important to Phillips' musical sensibilities. Outside of work hours, Phillips devoted time and passion to realizing his long-held dream of opening his own recording studio. 
This he achieved when, on January 3, 1950, the Memphis Recording Service at 706 Union Avenue opened its doors, recording amateurs and professionals alike. In fact, anybody wandering in off the street had a chance of cutting a record, often with no charge. To supplement his meager income, Phillips also operated a mobile service for recording weddings and funerals. Phillips had a method of producing uh, which was unique for the time. He valued feel over technical quality, stating that it was perfectly okay to include mistakes if the atmosphere of a recording was right. Slowly, he built up a reputation as a fine producer, recording demos and masters for labels such as Chess and Modern Records. One of the artists he worked with at the time was B.B. King. King, as we have seen, thought highly enough of Phillips that it was to him that the rising star directed Ike Turner and his band. Sometime in March 1951, Ike and his Kings of Rhythm set off on a hopeful road trip to visit Memphis, but before they arrived there, a significant twist of fate occurred, one which played a pivotal role in the development of rock and roll. As Phillips himself tells it, whilst driving from Clarksdale to Memphis along Highway 61, the band's car suffered a flat tire. They stopped to dig out the spare, and in the process, Willie Kaiser's guitar amplifier fell from the car. Both the woofer, the part of an amp dedicated to producing the low-frequency sounds, and the cone, the diaphragm essential to converting movement to sound, suffered major damage, but the band carried on undaunted. When they reached Phillips' studio, the extent of the problem became evident. As no replacement amplifier was available, Phillips stuffed newspapers into the holes as a makeshift remedy. When Kaiser plugged in his guitar and began to play, it produced a loud buzzing tone. Phillips, far from being disappointed, was delighted. He had long been drawn to unconventional sounds and methods, and insisted that the band should go ahead and record. The song they selected to cut uh, was, of course, Rocket 88. The title Rocket 88 references the Oldsmobile Rocket 88 automobile. Lyrically, the song covers the now classic rock and roll themes of cars, girls, and booze. You women have heard of jalopies, sings Brenston. You've heard the noise they make. But let me reintroduce my new Rocket 88. As a brief aside here, this wasn't any new theme. In fact, while you've probably never registered it before, if you go back and really look at the lyrics to the so-called Christmas song Jingle Bells, this too is about this very thing. But before Cars, it was teenagers racing their sleighs to impress their women, such as Ms. Franny Bright in the song Jingle Bells. And while this particular song has survived the ages, around the same time Jingle Bells was first composed in the mid-19th century, these sorts of fast carriages, pretty girls songs were all the rage. In any event, go back to Rocket 88. The recording contains the driving rhythm and irrepressible energy of the high-octane end of R&B from the period. But the kings of rhythm take things to a new level. Turner's piano pumps and thumps, the drums swing, and the saxophones sway. Raymond Hill provides a hot solo, but it's Will Kaisart's guitar which makes the piece. His playing buzzes and bounces, transmitting a hard-edged energy which sounded unlike anything else recorded at the time. Jackie Brenston, who sang lead vocals on the track, later stated that the song was not particularly original, a simple 12-bar blues structure which borrowed from a 1947 release, Cadillac Boogie, by Jimmy Liggins. However, Turner tells a different story as to the song's genesis. Speaking in a 2002 interview for Mojo magazine, he stated that the inspiration for Rocket 88 came during one of the band's lengthy road trips. According to Turner, to ward off boredom, uh, we bet nickels and dimes on what cars we'd see and would count the cars as we passed them from there to where we were going. The Oldsmobile had just come out, so I said, I bet we see less Oldsmobiles than we see Chryslers. Indeed, the hydromatic drive V8 Oldsmobile 88, to give the vehicle its full official name, had only been released the previous year. Advertised as Futurematic, it was one of the fastest road cars of its time. As Turner has it, the improvised lyrics were later finished in the studio, with Turner composing the music from scratch, with no reference to Cadillac Boogie. As will be seen, this is just the first controversy arising from the record. What happened next is up for debate. We know for sure that Sam Phillips leased the recording to Chess Records, who in turn released it as a single. That single, however, was credited not to Ike Turner and his Kings of Rhythm, but to Jackie Brenston and his Delta Cats. According to some sources, because Phillips wanted to put out a different type of record by Ike Turner, he asked Chess to change the official credits. Others contend that it was an error by Chess Records, which led to Ike Turner's name being left off. Whatever the truth, the song hit number one on the Rhythm and Blues charts, where it stayed for five weeks. It sold an astonishing for the time half a million copies and was ranked third overall for the year in terms of radio airplay. The miscredit, however, continued to be a bone of contention between Brentston and Turner. 
The argument soon escalated, leading to the immediate collapse of the band after Brenston left to pursue a solo career. Both men continued to press claims as being the chief composer and writer of Rocket 88 for the rest of their lives. Money inevitably also proved a source of irritation. In a 1971 interview with Rolling Stone, Turner stated that I only got $40 for writing, producing, and recording it. This is a somewhat strange statement, as it was Sam Phillips who indisputably produced the session. Tina Turner, Ike's future wife, in a 1986 autobiography, I, Tina, My Life, story says that Ike and the Rhythm Kings were only paid $20 each for the session, with the exception of Jackie Brenson, who sold the rights to Sam Phillips for around $900. Given the conflicting accounts, it's unlikely that we'll ever know the exact figures involved. What we do know is that the song had a major and lasting influence. In the Rolling Stone History of Rock and Roll, musicologist Robert Palmer cited Rocket 88 as being an important milestone in the evolution of popular music, singling out the record as being wilder and rougher than its contemporaries, taking particular note of Kaiser's fuzzed-out, over-amplified guitar. In his biography of Jackie Brenston, Bill Dahl of All Music declares, Determining the first actual rock and roll record is a truly impossible task. But you can't go far wrong citing Jackie Brenston's 1951 chess waxing of Rocket 88, a seminal piece of rock's fascinating history with all the prerequisite elements firmly in place. In his 2006 book, Rockin' Down the Highway, The Cars and the People That Made Rock Roll, rock historian Paul Grashkin echoes the opinion that this all combined to create, as one reviewer later put it, the mother of all R&B songs for an evolutionary white audience. Ike Turner himself, reflecting in a later interview with Holger Peterson, opines, I don't think that Rocket 88 is rock and roll. I think that Rocket 88 is R&B, but I think Rocket 88 is the cause of rock and roll existing. Sam Phillips got Dewey Phillips to play Rocket 88 on his program, and this is like the first black record to be played on a white radio station. And man, all the white kids broke out to the record shops to buy it. Today, if you Google what was the first rock and roll record, you'll find Rocket 88 high up in the mix. As has been pointed out many times, it's an impossible question, as in reality, nothing is ever so straightforward. Like any music genre, rock and roll evolved over time from many different sources and with many different influences, and there is no single recording which kick-started the movement. If we're talking about the earliest record, which is recognizable as rock and roll, however, that's another argument, and one which continues to be debated until this day. For many people, Rocket 88 does indeed stand as the premier recording in this category, and with good reason. John Lennon said, If you tried to give rock and roll another name, you might call it Chuck Berry. And it's certainly true that Berry's music influenced generations of musicians to come. Berry's first single was not released until 1955, however, four years after Rocket 88. According to Little Richard, meanwhile, the answer is simple. I am the innovator. I am the originator. I am the emancipator. I am the architect of rock and roll. Again, though, Richard's first hit, Tutti Frutti, came out in 1955. The aforementioned Lewis Jordan is another name which regularly crops up when discussing this topic with his 1949 cut, Saturday Night Fish Fry. While Jordan's track certainly possesses the requisite driving bass line, swing, and electric guitar, and is an acknowledged influence on Chuck Berry himself, the frenetic, wild energy of Rocket 88 isn't present. Jimmy Preston's Rock This Joint from the same year adds an ear-catching raucous vibe, and Arthur Crudup's That's Alright Mama, five years younger than both, proved a great inspiration to Elvis Presley with its anarchic feel and wild urgency. But there can't be many listeners who would identify either song as rock. Turner then certainly has good cause to believe in the legacy of Rocket 88. One significant consequence of the success of the single was that it earned Sam Phillips enough money to set up his own record label, Sun Records. In 1954, Sun Records put out the very first single from a 19-year-old truck driver by the name of Elvis Presley. Incredibly, Phillips and Sun Records would go on to discover and release music by Jerry Lee Lewis, Roy Orbison, and Johnny Cash. Thanks to his evolutionary mindset, eye for talent, and innovative production techniques, Sam Phillips now occupies a central position in the history of rock and roll. Ike Turner himself went on to enjoy great success as a double act with his wife Tina Turner, scoring multiple hits and running a lucrative recording studio which played host to the likes of Paul McCartney, George Harrison and Little Richard. That all ended in 1976 when Tina filed for divorce, citing irreconcilable differences. She would later accuse Ike in her book, I, Tina, of long-term domestic abuse. By this time, Ike's cocaine addiction had spiraled out of control. In 1991, Ike and Turner were jointly inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Turner wasn't able to attend, as he was then serving a four-year jail term for driving under the influence of drugs. He recovered somewhat, both personally and professionally, releasing a final studio album in 2006, a year before his death. 
As for Brenston, after splitting with the Kings of Rhythm, Jackie Brenston recorded and released a handful of singles under his own name, many of which were produced by Sam Phillips. They weren't a great success, however he later rejoined Ike Turner, working with him until the early 1960s. It seems that the two men's relationship remained strained. Brenston was seldom allowed to take lead vocals and was never permitted to sing Rocket 88 in the band's shows. Brenston declined into alcoholism. During the 1970s, he drove a truck for a living until his death from a heart attack in 1979. But to conclude, Rocket 88, for multiple reasons, stands as an important landmark in the evolution of rock and roll. It kick-started Sam Phillips' remarkable career, spurred Ike Turner towards success, that laid down a template for raucous, high-energy music. That distorted guitar tone with its dangerous edge foreshadowed much of what was to follow. Perhaps most remarkably of all, none of this might have happened if it were not for an accident with an amplifier on the way to a recording session.